Okay. Um, thank you for joining me on this discussion. Um, my goal here is to introduce you to what I've been working on, uh, me and a bunch of people for the past two years. Uh, the topic is integrated artificial intelligence. And that is um, a view of artificial intelligence that is based on uh, a mindful relationship with its connection to life, to human beings. It's coming from a slightly different point of view than what you'd normally hear about in you know, the media or science fiction. So um, my focus here today is to ask questions. I'm not going to try to convince you of anything. I'm just gonna try to ask you things. And I really want you to think and be awake and try to make your own, make yourself, I'm not the expert, you're the expert, figure out for yourself. I think that skill to kind of think for yourself is gonna be essential to be successful in the uh, coming age of artificial intelligence that we're entering right now. And as a first question I wanna ask is, are we there yet? You know, are we in the stage of artificial intelligence? Second one. All right, it works. Okay. So, what is intelligence? Um, there's so many different definitions of intelligence. It's not clear what intelligence is. Um, some people think intelligence is the same as consciousness. I don't. Uh, some people think intelligence is the same as mind. Uh, so, I'm going to clearly define just one type of intelligence. If that's not your definition of intelligence, please don't be offended. Just work with me on this one, because uh, it will take us uh, far. So, um, if you are uh, an ice, a snowflake, you know, special snowflake, and uh, you were falling, at some point, if the, uh, you transition to some hotter region, you will melt and you'll become a drop of water, right? So essentially, you die. So for something to actually survive for more than just a little bit, it has to manage entropy. It has to resist the natural tendency of the physical world towards disorder. So for the case of a snowflake, it might develop wings, and then the snowflake will stay within a certain temperature zone, and then it will not, um, it, will, it basically won't go away. So things that exist in the world for some time in this dynamically complex world that are that is changing um, have to minimize disorder or maximize order. So that's our definition, our working definition of intelligence for today. So how does that happen? You cannot really uh, minimize order directly. So what you do is you try to measure it. You create a model of the world and you try to minimize the difference between the model, your model of the world, your view of the world, and your perception of the world. So you can do that in two ways. One is you can create better models of the world, which is what we call perception. Or you can change the world to look more like your model, which is what we call action. So this active view of intelligence goes hand in hand with building models and then using them to um, make the world more like you. So uh, how is that possible? The, well, this wouldn't be possible in most places in the universe. It wouldn't be possible if the, if the world was too organized, it, too, too static. You wouldn't have anything to evolve, right? Uh, this wouldn't be possible if the world was too active, uh, if the temperature was too high, they have too much energy. But we live in this semi-structured world. We're at the edge of chaos. We have sufficient structure, so we have hierarchies. Um, our hierarchies is not exactly what we have. What we have is a uh, system that can be approximated by hierarchies, different layers of complexities. We see that both in nature and in human design. So my apartment, this is the design of my apartment, and it's, it follows a structural hierarchy, and a lot of nature seems to approximate that. Not perfectly like that, but it's a decent approximation. 
But when we actually try to measure um, in the brain the receptive fields uh, at different levels of, of, of the hierarchy, we, we see that there's, a, there's standard patterns that the brain can create when it tries to learn to perceive on, or act on the world. And interestingly, when we build machine learning models or artificial intelligence algorithms to operate on images, we get the same similar patterns. So the, vi the first visual layer of the neocortex looks a lot like the first layer of a neural network that we train in our lab. So what is the elements of integrated AI now that we know what I is? Um, well, the idea here is that we want AI to learn from people, right? from every individual. It's not taking the average of all of you. It is learning something from each one of you, being personal. right? So it doesn't have its own goals. It doesn't have its own objective. It's not trying to do its own thing. What it is trying to learn what you want. And you can teach it. Right? So the way you can teach it is by demonstrating what you would like. Right? So if you actually go and uh, do a task, tell the AI, well, this is how I want my house to be cleaned. Right? The way I like my house to be cleaned is very different than maybe the way you like to be cleaned. I like, for example, my uh, pillows on the corner, not on the bed. Um, so you show it how you like things to be done, and it's going to learn it, and it's going to start doing it for you. And so it has to be able to handle the diversity of your style, of how you want to do things, and how you like, to, how like to, you have things. So you want it to capture your style. And there's one kind of, um, there's one core problem that in, if we can solve, enables us to do this. And that's the problem of imagination. If we can create imagination, it means we can um, understand the creative, uh, understand how to create different things under different contexts just by a small number of data. So for example, you just met me right now, right? And just by meeting me right now, you can imagine me in different clothes, you can imagine me dancing, you can imagine me doing all sorts of things. And that's an amazing power that you have. And that power is at the center of what will enable integrated AI. So what does that mean concretely? From a technical point of view, we talk about something called unsupervised learning. So unsupervised learning is computers that learn without any, any labels, any supervision. They're able to learn on their own. And they're able to do this uh, effectively, create a model. Right now, when you talk about AI, usually there is um, a model that is being trained by someone uh, that that person gives them labels. So if the AI wants to learn uh, whether this picture or this video has a cat, you'd have to give it examples of um, pictures of cats and the fact that they're cats. But <laughs> unsupervised learning lets you learn a model of the world without actually providing any labels. And we want to work with adversarial training. Adversarial training is the idea that you have two learning algorithms that are interacting together. One algorithm is uh, working on understanding the world by generating it. So it's trying to take the world, map it to uh, a space where it can, a conceptual space, learn a model of the world, and then generate it back. And then there is an adversary that is trying to uh, criticize that model. So it's trying to tell this model whether it's being, uh, it is learning something good or not. And the feedback from the adversary is essential in teaching the generative model how to operate. So it is kind of like a Turing test, but instead of a human and a computer, we have a computer against a computer. The third um, technical thing, and there will not be technical things after this, uh, is the low sample complex complexity learning, which is the idea of learning with small data. Right now, there's a lot of talk about big data, but I think the future is for small data. Because if you want to learn about um, you, we have to be able to do it from one or two examples only of watching. That's essential for uh, imagination. So 
I'm going to give you a quick tour of the latest progresses that we've seen in um, machine intelligence over the past few years, and then we can um, talk a little bit about the implications. So this is a very interesting result. We take words, uh, and then we put them in a conceptual space, and in that space, you can create analogies, simple analogies, like uh, king is to queen as man is to woman by doing simple math, just vector math, vector arithmetic. You can do that for um, gender, you can do that for verb, you can do that for country and capital. So if I take um, Italy and subtract it from uh, well, Rome, and it's the same as Germany, uh, what is the capital of Germany? Berlin. Berlin. Okay, yeah. So. That's amazing, right? So you're able to, ha the computer now can think in analogies, just like we do. So this happened uh, last year, and it was a big breakthrough in artificial intelligence. Depending on who you ask, people would have thought this is either impossible or at least 10 or 20 years down the line. So people were able at uh, uh, Radford, uh, the first group was able to create the same type of system, but for images. So if, you, if I take a picture of someone with eyeglasses and I subtract it from someone without eyeglasses, uh, who's a man, and I add it to a picture of an average woman without eyeglasses, I can create the picture of an average woman with eyeglasses. You can do that for um, eyeglasses, for smiles, for facial expressions, for hairstyles for uh, gender identity. So that same th analogy property that we saw with words, we, we're now seeing it with, um, with images. And we took this work and improved it. So now, like f only a few months after this work, we got the quality results to be so high that we can create um, this video, this sequence of images from just looking at two images, and we can interpolate between them. So we can, we can create a high quality, um, we can generate high quality people doing different facial expressions. We can take a picture of you, you can make you smile, we can, we can make you do whatever um, w that is within um, a standard. And that, uh, to, to go from the previous slide, which the results didn't look great to this slide, only took a few months. So this um, is a uh, recent work last month by um, my colleagues at uh, DeepMind. Do you mind playing? Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. This is the state Aspects of the art. of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. Now this is their result. The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770 to 1850. Okay. So let's pause it here for a little bit. So what you're hearing is uh, text-to-speech. So this is like Siri or whatever assistant that you use. Uh, it takes text and then it has to generate the sound. And you can see, last month we got to a milestone that it's almost as good as humans. We cut down the difference between computer and humans by more than half. Do you mind? is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. Let's pause it for a little bit, please. Thank you. So, um, here, it shows you that the same model is able to generate the, s the sound in different styles. So it, we can change the gender, we can change the emotion, we can generate, um, so if we can generate basically anything we want, combination between gender and emotion and um, identity. So in the future, your assistant might sound exactly like the person you want it to sound like, right? So I would like to get wake up calls from my mom's uh, 
voice, for example. So this is music that's composed by the same exact algorithm. Same algorithm that generated um, this amazing text-to-speech result is composing classic music. As, and as you can tell, if you know anything about classical music, this is really good. This is amazing, actually. Um, so we're very excited about that. So let's go to the next slide. Next, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, robots, right? So imagination and robots, that enables us to learn from demonstrations. So this is a video of um, my colleague here teaching a robot how to open a door. And the way he does it is he demonstrates it. And then if he just re presses repeat, the robot just imitates exactly the same thing and opens the door, right? But, okay, after training, we'll see better results. Now, the robot can not only open this door, but it can open the door even if you change the door, if you change the location of the door. So it's learned how to generalize from that example that's been given to open maybe doors of different colors, different positions, and you can see it successfully doing that. This result came out this month, by the way, a few weeks ago, uh, actually a week ago. So um, I'm just giving you an idea of how fast this, the pace of the field is growing. And this generalization would have been considered extremely hard uh, last year. So you can repeat the same thing over and over, but what you're seeing here is that it is learning to do it under different situations. Um, and it's, it's not perfect, so it's gonna fail, I think, in this trial. Yeah, because it was too far. But g give it a couple of months. So next slide, please. So what does this mean for you? Um, my suggestion is work on becoming an artist, right? Um, and an, what is an artist? To me, an artist is someone who is uh, a creative in their field. So you can be an artist uh, in cooking, you can be an artist in science, you can be an artist in parenting, basically doing something outside inertia outside anything that can be automated. To be an artist, it means to add expressive value, to, to go very deep and bring out something new to the world. Okay. So Einstein is one of my favorite artists. And this is a handy tool that I use for how to create creative manifestations in the world. And this, this tool is written like this, but it has existed has correspondences to different traditions. For example, uh, Chinese medicine has a similar system. Um, Tantra or chakras have a similar system to this. But really, essentially, it boils down to, the creative process boils down to exploring something with your heart and then figuring out concrete ways to define things, having a clear vision, that's the objectives part, and then taking small steps towards making things happen. And then life somehow creates habits in which you can keep doing things more and more automatically, right? So this is a steps by which you can manifest things creatively. That's how it's always been. So what does integrated AI do? It basically automates the habits process. It takes care of the habits for you. Now, it also helps you iterate on small steps. So it can free you up to focus on the first two things here, exploring and setting goals. 
So, so it enables you to spend more time, more of your energy, more of your awareness on your artistic endeavors in life. Now, there is a different um, related branch in AI, which is called reinforcement learning, which tries to go directly from uh, goals to behavior without going through this natural creative manifestation process. And that has a lot of ethical issues, a lot of uh, safety issues, which we're debating right now. We're going to be de debating for the next few years. Um, the White House recently uh, outlined uh, steps that we need to take to make sure this is safe. But that's not integrated AI. Integrating AI is the first step. It's basically automating habits and small steps so you can, do, um, you can be an artist. So what, what does that mean for society? If we're going to automate habits, right? If anything that can be written down in a formula, if anything that you can do once, we can learn and we can repeat. You, we only need you to do it once or twice, that's it, and we can repeat it. So what, what does that mean? I think essentially we need a much more um, robust safety net. So we definitely need basic income, I think. So, and, and I think um, this is becoming a popular idea right now. It's, it, it's not new anymore. Um, there's a lot of experiments around the world, uh, from India to Africa to uh, right here in Auckland, um, that we're experimenting with basic income. Because it it's just makes sense. So a lot of people talk about how, how would we fund basic income? Well, there is an answer, and it's called land value tax. Please read up on it. I don't have time to go through this, but it's an answer that actually is so clean it um, enables a better economy overall, generate enough revenue for basic income and more, and is good for nature. So we should be looking into this. In a few years from now, if I give a talk on this conference, I'm gonna be like, okay, land value tax is kind of a popular thing now. It's what people are talking about. Mark my words. So we need experimental cities. Uh, so. We need different work organizations. We need this because um, the way we've designed our cities is so archaic, it doesn't really match a lot of the human values. It's based on economic interest. So let me give you an example. A simple example is a self-driving car, right? So much of our cities is designed for traffic, it's designed for parking. Can't, can't we create better cities if we had narrower roads with a lot more walkable neighborhoods. And our work organizations, can we, how can we support this new, um, this new work values that's gonna be very dynamic? You're not gonna do the same job all your life, right? You're gonna do multiple jobs, maybe, maybe multiple jobs every year. So how can we create work organizations that's adaptive to that? And related is the creative exchange economy. If you're an artist, how can we make you reach anywhere in the planet? Your artistic creations, how can we have that exchange? These are very interesting questions that we're beginning to tackle and we have some answers to, but there's nothing concrete yet that I, I'm, I'm uh, ready to share. And finally, the compassionate economy. And, um, that is a different understanding of what us, the average person that might not have been lucky enough to become the artist, do they really add value to the, to the economy overall? Does that, you know, if you're giving them basic income, do they really add value? And they do, in fact, because once, if you're in the system and for some reason you're not being your best, you're not integrated, you're suffering, it means the system is broken. So by looking at the, your data, we're able to improve the system. We find the cracks. So in, in this system that we're proposing, whether you are an artist or whether you're suffering, you are adding value, right? When you're an artist, you're adding value by creating art. When you're suffering, you're creating value by giving us an opportunity to find what's wrong with the existing system. So we can improve it and we can um, help you better. So with this, I thank you and
welcome your questions.